Mothers, mothers, we're in this series called Tell Me the Story of Jesus, and I was trying to figure out how to tie this into Mother's Day. I didn't do a very good job. But mothers are always in the mix, right, men? I mean, mothers are always there, you know, they're always doing this between their children. Quit fighting, quit organizing, you know, quit, quit, quit having this, or they're, they're on top of everything. I mean, my wife is the most detailed and engaged and involved mother, grandmother, woman in the world. Like, she's got an opinion on everything. She's going to be involved in it. She's going to help you. I mean, you can't sit down and talk to her for a moment without her saying, hey, let's just talk about your life and how we can make it better. I mean, this is what moms do. They are always in the mix. They are referees, judges. They're prosecutors. They're trying to make their record straight. I mean, it's all about solving the misinformation of the family. Right? right? I mean, there's this misinformation. We're going to deal with it. Well, I'm sure your mother was probably a lot like mine. My mother, Nora, was no different. She was always, always, always in the mix. And I'll never forget this one moment where my mom was, she was in the mix. And this is the story. As you know, I had a lot happen to me. And so in my senior year, I am out running because I like track. I was out running. I hate running, but I love track. How do you like that? So I'm out running on the highway with my guys, and we're getting ready for the track season. And uh, all of a sudden, Mr. Edmonds drives up next to us as fast as he can. He slows, slams on the brakes, and he jumps out. He says, hey, Ron, your mom really needs you. Well, just so you know, when those things happen in my life, that normally means one thing. Who died? First thing that came to my mind, ah, great. I thought I had made it. Somebody's died. So I get in the car. Wayne probably doesn't even remember this. I said, hey, what's going on? He says, I don't know anything. Your mom just needs you. I said, all right, mom. What do you need? So he takes me home. I get in my car. I go home. I walk in the door. My mom's just got the look. How many of you know the look? I mean, I'm getting the look. And the first thing I'm thinking is, I have done nothing. I'm an innocent man. But you can tell it's the look. And I say, Mom, what's going on? And with the look, she's like, you know what's going on. I said, no, actually, I don't know what's going on. Oh, you know. And she reaches over and she clicks. I know this is going to be old school. The uh, recorder on the phone, right, the message machine. You know those things that have the blinking red light, you have a message? And all of a sudden, a voice comes across, and it says this. Hey, this is Mr. Engel. My daughter is six months pregnant. I want to know what the is going on. Mr. Engel was the father of the girl I had dated the year before and had moved away. And I'd even helped them move down to Montana, and I... I am like, uh, hmm, (laughs) this is not a good moment. And so my mom proceeds to tell me, what's going on? I'm thinking, of course, I'm calculating that this is impossible. (laughs) Like, I thought it was impossible. I didn't know you could get that way from kissing, but maybe. I'm processing it. I'm like, mom, there's just, there's, there's some mistake here. She's like, It clearly isn't a mistake. (laughs) There's a voice recording. And I'm like, Mom, that's just impossible. Don't lie to me, son. You know how it is. Moms have all been in the house. Don't lie to me, son. I'm, of course, at this time, I am white as a ghost, first of all. (laughs) Then I start to think, you know, in my mind, I'm thinking, what in the world did that girl do with someone else? No, I didn't go there. I'm in the moment petrified, and I'm like, this, something is wrong. This cannot be. And she's like, son, we've, what are we going to do about this? I'm like, mom, this is not the story. And so I, I said, uh, I hit play again, just because I'm thinking, this, what? Sure enough, he comes on. He's not happy, let's just say. And all of a sudden, it hits me. I said, mom. 
This is your son, Russell, playing a joke on me. You should have saw her. I hit it again. I said, this is Russ. <laughs> and I hit it again. And oh, my. She said, get out of the house. <laughs> I don't know what that conversation was like between my mom and her son, Russ. But I can tell you, it wasn't pretty. <laughs> but this is what moms have to do, right? I mean, moms are like, we're in. I'm gonna, we're getting into this. Ah, I don't know about you, but it's hard to be misunderstood. I mean, it's hard not to have words. It's, it's hard to portray one thing and something else comes out. Of course, my brother, Lever, he, la he thinks it's the funniest thing in all the planet. And, of course, my mom just thought she was going to die and kill me at the same time. She didn't think it was so funny. You know, we're, we're in those situations, right? We find ourselves in places where there's just this... Difficulty. There's a lot of misunderstanding. Maybe it's with your boss or your wife or your kids. I mean, maybe you find yourself misunderstood. I don't know about you, but I hate to be misunderstood. I am told all the time, hey, that's not what you said. And in my mind, I'm thinking, I said exactly that. But somehow I didn't say it. But I'm misunderstood. I'm sure, again, you're quite misunderstood. You know, we don't like when we're taken out of context. We're, we don't like it when we find ourselves in this place. And, and this is where Jesus found himself with our story this week. He, he found himself in a place where everything about him was being misunderstood. It was being misunderstood. I mean, people just weren't getting it. They were going directions that he did not improve or uh, approve of. He did, he, they, were just, they were doing something different. And matter of fact, they be, started to become his enemy thinking that they were following him. And he didn't handle it well. And again, if you're like a mother or if you're anybody today, you do not like this to happen. So if you have your Bibles, let's open it up. And we're just going to read the text today. And then we're going to just kind of break down some of this. What is it when Jesus is misunderstood? Matthew chapter 15 and verse 1 starts out like this. Then the Pharisees and scribes came to Jesus from Jerusalem and said, Why do your disciples break the tradition of the elders? For they do not wash their hands when they eat. And Jesus answered him and said, And why do you break the commands of God for the sake of your traditions? For God commanded, Honor your father and mother, and whosoever reviles his father or mother must surely die. But you say, If anyone tells his father or his mother, What you would have gained from me is given to God. He need not honor his father. For the sake of his own, your own tradition, you have made void the word of God. He says, you hypocrites. Well did Isaiah prophesy of you when he said, this people honors me with their lips, but their heart is far from me. Moms hate it when their children obey, but their hearts are far away. In vain you do worship me, teaching as doctrines the commandments of men. And he called the people to him and said to them, hear and understand. It is not what goes in the mouth that defiles a person, but it is what comes out of the mouth that defiles a person. When his disciples came to him and said, do you know that the Pharisees were offended when they heard this saying? He answered, every plant my heavenly father has not planted will be rooted up. Let them alone. They are blind guides and the blind leads the blind. Both of them will fall into the pit. But Peter said, explain to us this parable, parable. And he said, you also still without understanding. I mean, what's wrong with you, Peter? Aren't you listening? Do you not see that whatever goes into the mouth passes into the stomach and is expelled? But that which comes out of the mouth proceeds from the heart and defiles a person. For out of the heart comes evil thoughts, murders, adultery, sexual immorality, thefts, false witnesses, and slander. These are what defiles a person, but to eat with unwashed hands does not defile anyone. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for your word. Lord, we thank you for the simplicity that you bring to the heart of the law. Lord, your desire was not to make things complex so that man would create a bunch of traditions and rules that we would have to follow without purpose and meaning. Lord, you came from the very beginning, from the very start, and wanted to appeal to our hearts. 
that our hearts would pursue a heart of God. So, Lord, I help you give us some wisdom today as we learn and open this word. In Jesus' precious name, amen. You see, there's a lot of confusion in today's churches about what it means about the law and the rules and the regulations and the traditions and what Jesus came to do. If you have your Bibles, let's jump, jump to Matthew chapter 5 and verse 17. And, and let's just read a little bit about what Jesus says he came to do. Like what was his purpose? The story of Jesus is about this kind of content. He says this, do not think that I have come to abolish the law and the prophets. He says, listen everyone, I have not come here to abolish what I have said in the past. I am unchanging. I have not come to abolish the law, but to fulfill it. This is important. For truly I say unto you, until heaven and earth pass away, not one iota, not one dot will pass from the law until all is accomplished. Therefore, whoever relaxes in one of the least of these commandments and teaches others to do the same will be called least in the kingdom of heaven. He didn't say you're going to hell. He said you're going to be the least. He like, listen, this is important. But whosoever does them and teaches them will be called great in the kingdom of heaven. For I tell you, unless the righteousness of our hearts succeeds, the scribes and the Pharisees, you will neither enter the kingdom of heaven. You won't even enter if it, unless it exceeds. Now listen, you have to understand the culture. These guys, they ate, drank, slept the law. All they wanted to do was follow the law. You see, Jesus wanted to make an example, though. What does it mean that he fulfilled the law? What is this idea? It's called completion. He completed the law. You see, the law was no longer a symbol or a sign or a system of obtaining righteousness. No, Jesus was the substitute of the law. It doesn't matter how hard you work, you cannot obtain righteousness except through Jesus the Christ. The end. However, we live righteously in our journey of sanctification by observing the law, knowing what it has to say. It's simple. And Jesus simplified it. Now, for those of you who are thinking about the law, I want you to know we're not talking about the ceremonial law and cultural laws that God had established. We're talking about the moral law. And for those of you who have never heard the moral law, who've always heard these words called the Ten Commandments, and by the way, there's a lot more to it than the Ten Commandments than just the Ten Commandments, but I would dare say most of the room today, most, many, or watching by television or the Internet, have never actually read what the Ten Commandments even are. So let's turn to Exodus chapter 20. And let's just read what they have to say. When Jesus says, listen, I didn't come to abolish the law but fulfill the law. I came to be the source of righteousness. I want you now to understand that righteousness doesn't come from the law, but the law is not void. It says this, you shall know, Exodus chapter 20 and verse 3, you shall have no other gods before me, nor shall you make for yourself carbon images or any likeness of anything that is in heaven or on earth or heaven or above. Or is on the earth beneath. Or that is in the waters under the earth. Like you're not supposed to worship anything else. You should not bow down to them or serve them. For I, the Lord your God, am a jealous God. Great note. God is a jealous God. He is the God. The only God. And he wants everyone to know that it is all about him. Visiting the iniquity of the fathers on the children to the third and fourth generation. And those of those who hate me. Listen, God takes the law very seriously. He says this, you shall not take the name your Lord, your Lord your God in vain. Oh my goodness, you can't walk through a day without hearing that. For the Lord will not hold him guiltless who takes the Lord's name in vain. He says this, remember the Sabbath day to keep it holy. Six days you shall labor and do all your work. But the seventh day is the Sabbath to the Lord your God. On it you shall not do any work, you or your Son or your daughter, your male servant, your female servant, your livestock, your sojourner who came within your gates. For, listen, in six days the Lord made heaven and earth and the sea and all that was in them and restored on the, rested on the seventh day. Therefore the Lord blessed the Sabbath day and made it holy. I want you to know something. Those of you who think in your mind that God created uh, the, the earth in seven time periods. It could have been thousands of days or millions of days. I want you to know Exodus chapter 20 says the exact opposite. It says that God created the earth in seven days. So you're like, whoa, that's amazing. Yeah, he's an amazing God. You're correct. He speaks, things happen. If you think that's amazing, then great. It should 
actually give you fear. The other thing is this, if you think, well, science doesn't prove that, it's about something else. I want you to know something about science. God can create a Brock a thousand years old by science. He can create a million years old. He can create whatever he wants. He's God. Hello. We're not. So, if you ever wonder, that's where I get a big argument. I have time to go there. Here's the next one, number five. <laughs> Honor your father and your mother, that your days may be long in the land. And that the Lord your God was, is giving you. Listen, man, that's a beautiful, long life promise. Why? This is the one these Pharisees are actually breaking. Then he says this, you should not murder, you should not commit adultery, you should not steal. You should not bear false witness against your neighbor. You shall not covet your neighbor's house, keeping up with the Joneses. Or his wife, don't steal her. His male servant, his female servant, his ox, the donkey. Or anything that is your neighbor's. When you drive down the road... Don't go, wow, wow. These Ten Commandments are moral law. They don't make you righteous by, oh, uh, by, 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 by observing them. They're not the definition. If you do these, you become righteous and go to heaven. No, you do these because you are righteous. And your desire is to please God on this journey. What does Timothy say about, or Paul say about this in 2 Timothy chapter 3 and verse 16? He says this, all scripture is God-breathed. Breathe out by God, profitable for teaching, reproof, for correction, and for training in what? In righteousness. So, clarity. Jesus comes to the earth, and he's engaging the world. He says, I've come to fulfill the law, not abolish it. I am the only thing that can provide righteousness. But in your righteous journey after you receive my righteousness is to live this way. Because this is what the Bible is for. For us to live in righteousness. Verse 17 says this, that the man of God may be complete, equipped for every good work. Why do we pursue righteousness? For the work of God. Yes. Not for the work of man. Yes. Did you hear that? Not for the work of a pastor who says this is what God says and it's not. Not for tradition. Not for this is the way we've always done it. Amen. This is what was happening in the day. You see, the law is a moral guide. To teach us and train us to live righteously. But it is, again, not what makes us righteous. And this is what Jesus is so frustrated with. The Pharisees, the religious leaders, have created all of these, these traditions, these beliefs based on the law that have nullified the law. Hmm. So Jesus comes. The story of Jesus, and he does something radical. He goes back to the beginning, and he says, listen... I need you to understand something, that the law is all built. Our journey, your and my journey of righteousness is all built on two things. It is to love God and to love others. Matthew chapter 22 and verse 37, we know this. You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, your soul, with all your mind. For this is the great and first commandment. The second is like it. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. On these two commandments depend all, all all the law and the prophets, everything was designed and created and established to show a love towards God and a love towards others. This is what God's law is. This is the beauty of it. Now, Jesus didn't end there. He's like, listen, I want to give you a new commandment because there's something missing here and there's something in the church that's happening and the religious leaders that's happening. And this is what's happening. We're seeing that Older people are being mistreated. We're going to get to that in just a second. So he creates another law. He says this, John 13, 34. It's really not new. It says it's new. A new commandment I give to you, that you love one another as I have loved you. You are also to love one another. By this, all people will know that you are my disciples of your love for one another. So he says, listen, I need you to understand this. Your job is to love God and to love others. But I want you to grasp this reality that the love for the brethren, the love for the church, this love is absolutely fundamental to being able to love someone else. If you can't love someone who loves God, you're going to struggle in life. If you can't deal with your differences, the world is going to think there's nothing happening in there. God's not transforming you. I want you to know something. This love is absolutely imperative. It is imperative. So now let's break into this passage. Let's just talk about it a little bit. This passage is beautiful. 
I don't know about you, but it gives me encouragement. Here's where he starts in verse 3. It says this, and he answered them, why do you break the commands of God for the sake of your tradition? Wow. Why do you break the commands of God? Notice in verse 2, why do your disciples break the tradition of the elders for they do not wash their hands? So there's these two arguments. We got this first one where they say, listen, you guys aren't washing your hands. Now, I don't know about you moms. But I would say I'm pretty guilty of not washing my hands. My mom would always say when I came in to play, what would she say? Go wash your hands. I would go in there and look at the faucet and go, I'm good. The washing of the hands, tradition. Somehow in our minds we think washing our hands is going to keep the germs away so we don't get sick. I'm of the imagination that if we don't wash our hands, our immune system gets stronger so we don't get sick. <laughs> I'm a pretty healthy guy outside of eating at McDonald's too much. So this hand washing thing got, Jesus is like, I'm sorry, what? What does washing your hands have to do with your holiness? What does washing your hands have to do with worshiping your God? In their minds, they had created this monster. Now, listen, they probably did a great job. They probably thought, man, this is really important. We should be holy when we present God. And we should be this, and we should be this, and we should be dignified. So let's make sure we're clean. It, it, was, a, it was a ritual cleaning they believed in. And I guarantee you, when it first started, it was good. It was, oh, that's, that makes sense. Before I read the Bible, I should wash my hands, make sure I'm clean, purified as a symbol. But it's exactly just that, a symbol. It doesn't actually equal anything. When he says this in verse 13, 3, he says, and why do you break the breads of your commandments? Jesus comes right back at him. He's like, hey, why do you break the commands of God for the sake of your tr traditions? For God commanded you to honor your mother and father. Who reviles this father and mother must surely die. He's like, listen, I want you to understand something. Yes, in your mind you might think washing the hands is important, but I want you to know you, you guys have created traditions that are messing up what I have had to say. What was happening? This story is very interesting. Notice verse 5. But you say, if anyone tells his father or his mother, what you would have gained from me is given to God, he need not honor his father. For the sake of your traditions, you have made void the word of God. What was happening? What was happening was this. Super spiritual people, and I'm sure none of you are, had come up with this idea that, and it was good. Listen, I'm going to vow all of my possessions to the temple, to the church. And I'm going to commit them to the church in advance, and I'm going to use them to live my life. But when I die, everything is going to go to them. So therefore, I don't have to or I won't use any of my goods for anything other than for God. Wow. By the way, I love that plan. So uh, sign up. We'll have a sign up in the lobby. Giving all your goods to the church. That'd be great. Now. No, what Jesus says is, you're missing something. It sounds super spiritual that you're giving your goods to the church, but the reality is you are literally lying. And you are doing something to not honor your parents. Now, this is a very touchy situation in today's cultures, my friend. Let me tell you, young people and older people, do you realize it is your family's responsibility to take care of their elderly. The end. If you have no children or your children are incapable and they don't have any grandchildren or great-grandchildren, then we can have a conversation. But ultimately, the responsibility to honor your parents was for us, the younger generation, to step up and take care of our parents. This is an embarrassment on the church, that this is not happening. It's not the church's corporate to take on that burden. It is your job. Your job. Don't get upset with me. It's your job. The unfortunate thing is this. It's so much easier to let the government do it. It's so much easier to have someone else do it. Do you want to know what it means for us to honor our parents? It means for us to take care of them when they're older, to honor what they have done, where they have gone. Listen, we have lost this 
in our churches. We have lost this in our society. Jesus says this, you hypocrites. Well did Isaiah prophesy of you when he said, the people honor me with their lips, but their heart is far from me. They do vain. They do, in vain they do worship me. Listen, we come to church, we think we're so righteous, so good, so whatever, and we dishonor the elderly. You hypocrites, that's what he says. I didn't say it. He said it. You hypocrites. You hypocrites. You have missed the point. Hmm. Notice Jesus brings clarity. And he called the people to him and said, hear and understand. It is not what goes in the mouth that defiles a person, but what comes out of the mouth that defiles a person. You see, Jesus came to bring clarity to his heart, which is to love God and to love others. Not to follow some silly, stupid rules. Not to act righteously doing one thing so you can get away with not doing what God has called you to do and commanded you to do. He has not done that. He has said, listen, if you love God and love others, you will. You will willingly and excitedly follow the commands that I have given you. It's that simple traditions that do not impact the word are simply words of men. Verse 12. Then the disciples came to him and said, do you know that the Pharisees were offended when they heard these sayings? I just want you to know, I love this verse. People tell me all the time, do you know you offended them? Yeah. Yes, I do. Don't you feel sorry? No. No, I don't. We have become culturally ignorant of what it means to offend. We offend unrighteousness. Jesus came to point out clearly, this is not the way of the Lord. When we say, listen, brother, you're not living the way of the Lord, it is positive, not negative. If the person feels offended, guess what? They might be feeling convicted. Like, oh, maybe Everybody doesn't agree with me. I know I'm having an affair, but I think it's right. And people actually do believe that, by the way. So we have this situation where Jesus comes in and he says, listen, he didn't shy away from the truth. He spoke the truth in love, boldly. He didn't wander away. He answered every plant that my heavenly father has, has, has not planted will be rooted up. And then he says, let them alone. For they are blind guides and they're leading the blind. And both will fall into the pit. Listen, in the past five years, in our church, we have changed some things. Amen? Some of my old timers will say, oh me, but amen. We've changed some things. We have changed some things that seemed very good. Matter of fact, they were all good things. Great things. Wonderful things. They just weren't necessarily God's things. They were just good, wonderful, great things. Washing your hands was a good, wonderful, good thing. Let's wash our hands. But if those things get in the way of us loving the lost and loving the brethren, they're in the way. They're in the way. This is not the way God designed it. Listen, we're to worship him with our lives, with our song, with our wealth. We're to love others as ourselves. I mean, this is what the law is. And I want you to know something else. Even today, if we're starting a tradition or a new beginning and saying this is the way we do things, I want you to know something, middle-aged people who will someday be older people upset when the younger people change it. Don't get hooked on this kind of worship music because I promise you in 30 years it ain't going to look like this. What's the fundamental? We worship God. This never changes. We come and we worship and we will give him all the glory. I don't know what it's going to look like in 30 years. I'm actually quite, quite petrified. But I do know this. It's all about him. And it's not about us. The moment we start to pick these things apart. The moment that we try to say, hey, this is my way. This is what I want. This is what I want. This is what I want. It's just like, you're missing it. And that's what was happening to these Pharisees. They were not getting it. He goes on in verse 15. He says this. But Peter said to him, explain the parable to us. Explain this parable. He said, you're still without understanding? 
Do you not know whatever goes into the mouth passes into the stomach and is expelled? But what comes out of the mouth proceeds from the heart that defiles a person. For out of the heart comes evil thoughts, murders, adultery, sexual immorality, thefts, fault, witnesses, slander. These are what defile a person, but to eat of unwashed hands does not defile a person. I want you to, I want you to have some relief here. Everybody makes the Christian faith so difficult. Oh, there's just all those rules. There's all those things that I just can't do. I can't do this, and I can't do that, and I can't do this, and I can't do that, and I can't. I mean, that's all I hear. I'm like, no, 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 no. No, it's just simple things. Two things. All Jesus wants you to do is to love him with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength. Pursue after him. Keep your focus on him and not on everything that you want to do in life because God's using you for his glory and his honor, and he's going to reward you for that one day. And when you live for yourself, you're going to get your own reward, and that reward is going to actually give you nothing. You're going to die with a bunch of money in the bank, and guess what? Somebody else is going to spend it. You're going to do some great things, and guess what? Someone else is going to enjoy it. It only matters what Christ's heart is for your life. That's all that's going to matter. That's all that's going to make a difference. But we oftentimes forget this. Forget this. It's just not complicated. It's simple. Love God and love others. Matthew eleven twenty eight 28 says this. Come to me, all who labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you what? Rest. Listen, this Christian life is not about turmoil burden. It's about rest. It's about being relieved. It's about understanding that you cannot earn heaven. God sent his son to solve that problem. It is his righteousness that gives us eternal life and our faith in that. And then this journey of righteous living is simply a gratitude life of what he's done on the cross. We, we listen, we honor the Ten Commandments not because it gets us saved, but because it's the right thing to do for a God who loves us. We honor our parents not because it's easy, but because God's commanded us to do this. Listen, when he says my yoke is easy and my burden is light, it just brings instant clarity. When it's saying that, it's saying, listen, I can bring you instant clarity. If you're wondering, man, I wonder if I should do this. Just ask yourself the question, is this a reflection of God's love for me and my love for others? Ding, ding, ding. I wonder if I should take care of my parents. Man, they're really on me. Ding, ding, ding. Does it honor God? Am I loving others? You see, this is why Jesus came. This is why Jesus came. The story of Jesus is about him showing that this is not a bunch of complex religious rules. This is a simple journey of loving him and loving others. Moms do this very well, just so you know. You want to know why God has commanded ladies to have to submit to husbands and husbands to love their wives? Because to ladies, love is cake work. Man, they put up with you so much. My wife puts up with me. I'm like, that's just crazy. <laughs> but men, on the other hand, love is one of those really tough things. I saw a lot of tears in men's eyes as these guys, these fine ladies, were praying about their lives. Men struggle with love. We struggle with the emotion of love. Somehow we think it's letting our guard down. And God's like, no, man, I need you to love others. I need you to love others. I need you to love. Ladies, I need you to understand some of this picture is submission. We're going to get into that in our next series. But this idea is beautiful. It's a reflection of me. Christ's desire for us is to think of others more highly than ourselves, and there's no better person to celebrate in doing this than a mother. Philippians 2, 4 says this, that each one of you look not only to his own interests, but also to the interests of others. Have this mind among yourselves, which is yours in Christ Jesus. Let each of us please his neighbor, in Romans 15, 2 says. For this is good, for his good, to build him up. Listen, Jesus came to tell his story to make life simple. Not complex. This Sunday... I hope you'll leave here with one thought. This Christian life is not to be a burden. It's to be a blessing. 
not to be a burden, but to be a blessing. I've been put on this earth not to dwell on my personal preferences of how the church is run and what happens and who does this. I've come here to love the brethren. Love the person right next to you. Three seats down from you. Two seats up. Four seats back. God has called you to spend the time to love one another. Because it's not what we do that makes us righteous. It's what comes out of our mouths. That's a reflection of our hearts. My friends, it's time for our hearts to reflect the glory of God. It's time for our hearts to look like that mother who's taking care of that precious little innocent child, sacrificing her whole life to raise this beautiful little baby. That's what love is. That's what Jesus came to explain. Don't get caught up in the rules. Love this baby. Love them. Let them know that I care for them. That's what Jesus is saying. Let that person down the, down the pew from you know that Jesus loves them. And Jesus is going to love them through me because I love Jesus. This, my friends, is the story of Jesus. Let's stand with our heads bowed. Church, it's prayer time. And the reality is this. Jesus comes to the earth, confronts the religious people who have made religion so awkward and so difficult and so stuffy and so impossible that love starts to be taken out of what God had created. Listen, I don't want Mountain City Church to be known like that. I want Mountain City Church to be known where everybody who walks through those doors, they know they're loved by you. They know that somebody wants to know them, wants to guide them, wants to instruct them, wants to bring them up. I pray that everybody who walks through those doors, who's a member of this church, when they walk to church, is like, praise God, I'm in a place where people love me. That's what we should be excited, that we should be wondering whether some, where someone is. There, nobody should even want to miss church because they're loved so much. They're encouraged so much. They're strengthened so much. Because this is the place where we worship God. We devote ourselves to his teachings. Why? Because he first loved us. If you're here today and you've never given your life to Jesus, if you're here for the first time and you've never given your life to Jesus, or maybe you've been coming for a while, I'm here to tell you something. God loves you so much that he sent his son. Why? Because he cares for you. He wants to forgive you. He wants you to live in freedom. He wants you to live in a relationship with him. And he says this, if you'll just confess with your mouth the Lord Jesus Christ and believe in your heart that he's risen from the dead, you shall be saved. Give your life to Jesus and he will give you a new life. If that's you today, pray. Ask God to forgive you of your sins. Ask him to be the Lord of your life. Make a commitment today. But for the rest of us in the room, it's Mother's Day. There's no greater day, no greater joy that a mom will ever feel than their son, daughter, husband, sister, brother, I don't care who it is, neighbor, getting right with Jesus. My wife gets so excited when our grandkids announce that they've become a believer or they announce that God's working in their heart. I mean, you can't get the joy off her face. So on Mother's Day, the altar is open. The altar is open. If you've been letting traditions and busyness and complication get in the way of what God's called you to do, like these Pharisees, repent. Repent. Don't stay offended repent. 
as they play and as they sing. Let's pray.